Okay, thank you very much, Tomato. Um, my talk is about stochastic resonance, and I will uh, try to give you uh, not a perspective on the problem of climate change, but an historical view on uh, why and how we came across uh, this concept uh, more than uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, the people involved are the one that you can see here. Unfortunately, Alfonso is no longer with us, but we were all of us uh, really uh, working together to clean up a concept that at that time was really was a little bit uh, strange, and somehow it uh, it is uh, um, discussed in other uh, situation with the same emphasis as 40 years ago. So let me, the two relevant publications are the one that you can see here, uh, the one published in 81 and the other one in Tellus in 82. Uh, I will make a, a first historical remark by saying that uh, we got the results uh, in February 80, so 1980, but then it was uh, not really simple to get published these papers because there were a lot of uh, controversy be not only because of uh, climate, but also because of the concept by itself. So let us start uh, with uh, the basic questions. Hmm? Why does climate change? Of course, I will not answer this question because it's too um, complicated, but let me roughly say, and I'm referring to the knowledge uh, that we were uh, somehow um, sharing with other colleagues about four years ago, that essentially there are two possibilities. Either you have some difference in the energy input, which means solar variability, or there are some internal mechanisms, which uh, uh, we will call internal variability. Now, we know that climate did change a lot over the last uh, 100 million years. But we focus uh, on the problem of the last uh, one, on, one million year. Here you see the sketch of uh, temperature between the glacial and the interglacial period. And you can see that there are up and down that occurs uh, every now and then during the last 1,000 million, one, uh, one million year. And uh, one of the questions that was, uh, and I think it still is, on the table is why we observe almost periodically change of uh, these two different climate states, okay? Between the interglacial and the glacial period. Now we are living in interglacial period, which was starting about, uh, let's say roughly speaking, uh, 18,000 years ago. But um, uh, the question was uh, uh, how much uh, can we, or what is the physical explanation for a temperature difference of 10 degrees that uh, was observed, or at least was uh, uh, inferred from ice record in the last uh, 1, 000, 1 million year. Okay, so let's start with the simplest non-trivial model of climate. I mean, uh, this uh, model of climate is very straightforward. You have uh, some radiation which is coming in. You have some reflection which is uh, coming out. And this reflection is mainly due to ice, but also to other uh, surfaces and clouds. And uh, you have, uh, uh, by definition, the infrared emission, the one which we care a lot during these days because of climate, the present climate change. So let us um, assume that you know how much uh, infrared emission you have if you know the Earth temperature. Then the problem is to have, a, of course, you definitely know how much uh, radiation you have uh, from the sun. And so uh, the first thing is to make a reasonable uh, um, assumption that the two things, uh, if you know how much reflection albedo you have uh, uh, from the hurt, uh, is uh, to understand whether there is a simplified relation, but basic, I mean, it cannot be much different from that, um, give you uh, the 
the present work time for sure. And the result is uh, that it, it's working. I mean, of course, uh, in order to, to solve this equation, you have a, must have a good estimate of this quantity, which more or less can be obtained from present measurements, uh, but also it was uh, already obtained in the past. Uh, and uh, uh, if you balance, hmm, suppose that the, I mean, it is not true that it's linear, but we don't care. Suppose that you balance the infrared emission with the difference between the inside, the, 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 the radiation which is coming from the sun and the one that is going outside the sun, then what you get is a, an equilibrium, stable equilibrium state, which is this green bubble here, which more or less refer to the present climate state. Now, you may, may you can make a reasonable guess on how albedo is a function of the temperature. It is definitely clear that if you have a, a hurt which is covered by ice, okay, an ice cover hurt state, then the albedo will be much bigger, and therefore the difference will be much smaller. And so this is the reason why, even in this extremely simplified model you must have at least three different climate states. Two of them are stable and one is unstable. Now, the, uh, it is interesting to say that uh, all climate models share this, uh, the possibility to have a stable steady state of ice cover hurt. Now, this one, uh, temperature here is not 10 degrees less than this, but it's, uh, 100 degrees, 150 degrees less. So it is definitely outside the uh, possibility to think that the highest cover hurt is a, a function, is a, the, what we call a glacial period. Nevertheless, all climate states are in the, uh, have this uh, feature of three different climate states. Okay, this was uh, the situation. Uh, this is the Boutique Sellers model. Uh, this was the situation, roughly speaking, at the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s. Uh, and the question is uh, 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 how can we ex still explain the interglacial glacial period? Now, I think that there is a, a very peculiar um, explanation, or at least observation on uh, the glacial interglacial period. Uh, you know that uh, the Earth uh, orbit experienced several kinds of uh, different periods concerning uh, its shape around the sun. And in particular, there is one of these periods, which is exactly 100,000 years, and is related to this centricity. There are other periods, but this is the only one which affect the, in, the uh, incoming radiation on the wall first. The other period are affecting its latitudinal shape or its longitudinal effect. Uh, and so they have no, globally speaking, a kind of uh, uh, zero, uh, they have a zero average on the earth. However, you can uh, look at, at much, how much radiation is uh, changed over 1,000, 100,000 years, and you find that the amount of radiation that uh, uh, it is changed, it's extremely small, 0 0.25 watt per meter square, which is uh, really extremely small if, uh, in front of uh, what you want to explain. With uh, this number, according to our present understanding, or at least 40 years ago understanding of climate, with this uh, 0 0.25 degrees, uh, you can, uh, watt per meter square, you can have a change in temperature, which is 0 0.2. So it's about one order of magnitude less than what you want. So if you say that the Milankovic forcing, as it's called, uh, gives you the information of, uh, gives you the, 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 the physical explanation for the interglacial, uh, glacial, uh, period, then you are you have a big problem. Hmm? So you have a big problem. You cannot explain ten degrees with that kind of change in the solar radiation. So that was the situation 
Uh, and that situation was uh, the one discussed in many meetings, in many papers. Uh, and uh, I remember that there was a little, a lot of uh, um, really interesting uh, problems arising and possibility uh, uh, trying to explain this, uh, this um, uh, interglacial glacial period due to the Milankovic. And uh, during that year, there were a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, discussion. So we started to think about this. To, to, uh, we started to think about uh, this problem, and uh, we tried to understand a little bit more. So now the effect of Milancho reinforcing in our simplified radiation model is uh, the one affecting the, our present climate, which is here in the green bu bubble. Now, suppose that you make a zoom of this region, which is here, when uh, the uh, solar radiation is going down, of course, this vert uh, horizontal line is going down as well, and it becomes this dashed line. And so you can, if you know the characteristics of our present climate, then you can easily compute uh, what will be the effect on our present climate of uh, a, a decreasing in the incoming solar radiation of 0 0.25 watt per meter square, which is uh, uh, roughly speaking, as I said before, 0 0.2 uh, degrees. So how to uh, get this 10 uh, degrees variation? Okay, so the mechanism of stochastic resonance uh, is in fact uh, something which comes from uh, three different uh, uh, efforts. Mm -hmm. One is the physical model. So the first thing one has to imagine is to have a physical model. The second thing, it's a very peculiar property of the stochastic resonance, which is uh, how to take into account uh, the role played by uh, uh, the so-called climate noise. Mm -hmm. I will speak a little bit of this problem because this is the conceptual point which was very, very controversial at the time we were discussing this problem. And in some sense, in some sense it's still controversial. And another thing which is peculiar of the time of where we were working, which is the role played by numerical simulations. So let's start with the physical model. So the basic was to say the following. Okay, let us assume that our knowledge of the albedo, it's uh, not exactly perfect as uh, everything in climate. I mean, we cannot imagine to have a perfect theory, but we can imagine to have a reasonable one. And uh, the basic starting point was to say, okay, since we observe two states, uh, in, if we still, assume that the balance uh, uh, of the radiation and the temperature, the thermodynamic balance is the one uh, important balance for climate to stay, to, to exist, to, to be stable, then we must assume that somehow there are two states. One is the glacial and the one, one is the present climate and the temperature difference between these two states is roughly speaking 10 degrees. Now, this is an assumption. There was a paper in 76 by Michael Gale that was in fact uh, uh, discussing the possibility that something like the one that I am showing here in this picture was uh, maybe possible with some uh, change in the parameterization of the albedo due to the increase uh, of cloudiness and the highs uh, on the on the sea, but I mean it was a speculation, and uh, of course uh, it's uh, reasonably correct to say that we make the assumption that there are two states. Now, the change in the albedo was really minor to get this in these two states, so it's definitely inside any possible observation that were. Uh, available and still are available available for this for this information. Remember that we are looking at an average over the wall Earth, so it's a, not a trivial issue. And we the difference here from these two is not the one 
that you see in the figure, but it's much smaller. I mean, it's order few percent of the present albedo. So it, 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 it is uh, consistent with the observation to make this assumption, but there is no evidence uh, which is uh, able to support this assumption, except the strong evidence that we experience to different states, which is definitely what we observe in the climax record. Now, of course, uh, <coughs> the question is, suppose that we have to us, uh, these two states, and suppose that the sun is uh, not periodically changing in time. Does it mean that we may expect transition, even without sun variability from the glacial to the present climate? Now, this is, uh, let me, say uh, the conceptual question, because uh, if you say yes, it implies that the system must have some internal mechanism for such transition to occur, which is possible. Now, remember that in 1980, the knowledge of uh, uh, the, the chaotic behavior in the, in the dynamical system was not so spread, but nevertheless, uh, uh, we were working on that, and so we knew that there are possibilities uh, 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 to, uh, to, to, to build up a reasonable model where some internal dynamics will have uh, this uh, transition from two different climate states. However, this transition may not necessarily be periodic, like for instance uh, in some chaotic system, but, and definitely may not have any periodicity close to the 100,000 year cycle. Now, the point is that in fact, we know, and one of the leader expert in this, in this framework was Barry Salzman at the Yale University. We know that we, there are a huge number of degrees of freedom in climate dynamics. And some of them have a, a huge, uh, I mean, very long time scale, up to a few thousand years, like for instance, the internal circulation of the ocean. And uh, so there is a huge spectrum of uh, different time scale in the, um, in the climate. And so if we want to keep uh, the discussion as simple as possible, that was one of our uh, main uh, motivation, we can imagine to have uh, uh, some internal mechanism, but uh, we need to understand how to take uh, into account such an internal mechanism. And of course, as, uh, as soon as you raise this question, the, the problem is what are the, the, the relevant degrees of freedom on the time scale we are concerning, so the time scale of uh, 10, uh, 10 to the five years uh, to take into account. Shall we take into account only the temperature? Shall we include also other, other quantities uh, or what? Mm -hmm. So this, is, uh, this was one of the questions, uh, for instance, Barry Salzman and Alfonso Zera were working for many years, but at the time uh, of the stochastic resonance, we were very aware of this problem, but we make a sharp, uh, a sharp uh, uh, statement. So the basic that in fact, the temperature was somehow the leading uh, quantity to take into account anyhow, okay? And the other quantity were, so to speak, slaves to the, what happened to the temperature even if they can induce some delay or nonlinear feedback that unfortunately we didn't know and we don't know yet. Huh? At, any how, uh, at any rate, I mean, we, we start by assuming that the temperature was uh, the most important variable and that uh, uh, all the possible uh, difference in the, um, in the, all the possible internal mechanism inside the climate was uh, to build up some noise uh, uh, inside the, the climate state uh, that we call the climate noise that is due to internal variability. Now, as soon as you 
put on the table this uh, uh, this idea of course uh, everybody will start to question because uh, there is a conceptual problem first of all what is the climate noise now uh, uh, <clears throat> the climate noise as uh, we introduced it at that time was uh, anyhow associated to the uh, variability of climate that we experience on a time scale which is much shorter than uh, 50,000 50, years. So, I mean, we know that the day by the year by year, if you look at 10 by 10 years, no matter how long, how long you take the time record within, let's say, 1,000 years, you observe fluctuation on any possible time scale. So, this will, we call it climate noise. And uh, we were assuming that such climate noise was uh, uh, the output of uh, the internal variability of climate. And we want to consider this climate noise as uh, the internal, internal mechanism which drives the system during its dynamics. Now, you have to imagine that the noise uh, in physics is always present. Everybody knows that the noise is present in observation, in measurements, and whatever. But it's uh, in fact uh, one of the main goal of physics to take to, to get rid of the noise uh, and to define the deterministic uh, uh, law which uh, underline the process that we are observing. Mm -hmm. This is inside the, our conceptual approach to physics, mm -hmm. and. Um, Therefore, if you have an explanation, uh, usually people ask you uh, the explanation in terms of uh, physical law, not in terms of uh, the noise that is supposed to be something accidental. Okay. Now, uh, let me spend a few words about this problem. Okay, the noise in our case is due to all the degrees of freedoms that uh, we are not considering. Uh, suppose that we have a noise in a system and suppose that you have a ball that is moving with the effect of the gravity which is moving on a surface like this okay and the ball is kicked by random uh, small uh, uh, tips of course uh, since the friction is larger the ball will not oscillate but if you kick it goes here and then it goes back if you go here it goes back okay now you can ask yourself uh, what is the probability that by this random kicks the ball will go on the other side the very the very important thing to take into account uh, is that you are asking for rare events and i remember that uh, the first time i discussed uh, the um, problem of stochastic resonance uh, with other people, not within us. Uh, Asselman, that was present during my first talk, was assuming that the, the bolt was like in the climate system, will have in oscillation because it was introducing the effect of the inertia. And this was because it was working with the effect of the noise for surface waves at that time. Now, here is not the case. And the transition from this place to this other place does not occur because you have a large kick. Because a large kick is something that implies that some, from time to time, there is a guy that gives you an important kick, a kick which is as big as the size of the system. And this is a physical problem if you want to understand this. Uh, effect is not a rare event a rare event that means that you have a kick in this direction then a kick in the same direction then the kick in the same direction up to the top of this surface then eventually the system will go on the other side now if you have a probability p to have a kick in one direction then you need a lot of kicks to reach the top of this hill and the probability to obtain such rare events uh, is exponentially large with the number or if you wish exponentially small actually with the number of steps you need 
compared to the size of the kick to reach the ball. Now, this is a rare event, and it's clearly a non-perturbative effect induced by the noise, okay? Now, such kind of rare events were never observed in classical physics. And in fact, they were observed in uh, quantum mechanics, where the noise is given by the quantum fluctuations. And you know that in quantum mechanics, you can escape from a, a potential well with a given probability. But in classical physics, of course, you, that you don't care about these rare events because usually you care uh, the, the, you as you are assuming that uh, the system is uh, con um, is uh, confined in a, in a single stable equilibrium however if your system has uh, two possible equilibrium then you must observe such rare events now the situation is a little bit uh, clear from the the numerical simulation. Now, don't care about the numbers, which are completely uh, qualitative, but care about the shape of the signal. What happens is that this, the system is oscillating uh, somewhere, like here, okay? Not oscillating. You keep kicking in this way, in this way, in this way, and then from time to time, you see that there is a path, a sequence of kicks with a sharp transition from one state to the other. Now, after almost 40 years, uh, we can uh, show you example of this uh, uh, effect, uh, not in the climate system, but in a very, very simple system. For instance, take the water. You put the water into a container and you heat the water from below. It's known that if you increase the temperature enough, uh, there is a, a turbulence which is starting. So the turbulence is confined in this box and eventually will give you a kind of mean flow with fluctuations, of course, which may occur in two ways. One is clockwise, like here, or the other one is counterclockwise. Now, the two situations are equally probable. And therefore, you must expect, unless there are no uh, other uh, fundamental reasons that from time to time the system can reverse its uh, mean flow. In fact, uh, this is observed in uh, experiments, okay? And so people start uh, to ask why there is uh, such uh, a reversal. The similar thing uh, in a completely different uh, situation, of course, uh, if you think of a dynamo, like the magnetic field of the Earth, which is always showing uh, uh, reversing from one direction to the other in a random ways. Now, uh, when you see something like that now, right now, I mean, if you take people working in magnetohydrodynamics or working in turbulence and you show that the experiment or the numerical observation gives you, or numerical simulation gives you such a reversal, the question that is asking to you is why? Now, there are cases where the question is in fact induced by large scale mechanism, which depends on the problem that you are considering. But there are cases in which the answer to this question is essentially due to what we call noise. Give you an example of that. We take the Navier-Stokes equation, we put the Navier-Stokes equation in the box, so everything is uh, deterministic. We numerically integrate the Navier-Stokes equation, so you spend a lot of computer time, okay? The only thing we do is to, um, uh, to make sure that the Navier-Stokes equation have two different states, like the one in the um, water. And uh, so what happens is that you may have either a clockwise or a counterclockwise large scale flow. And then you do the numerical simulation and you observe exactly this kind of behavior. So there is a reversal in time, which is induced by the turbulence. So the reason why this uh, reversal occurs is not because there is some uh, mechanism, a deterministic mechanism that you can trace 
mathematically or physically in the system. There is no large scale dynamics that you have to uh, discuss in order to explain this behavior. It is turbulence. Turbulence is acting on the large scale as if it is a noise. And therefore, depending on the amount of turbulence, depending on the, the characteristic of fissures of the system, you are able sometimes even to predict one, how long it takes to make a reversal from one state to the other. Some of them can stay very long time. Some can stay very short time. But anyhow, this is uh, what you get uh, from uh, deterministic numerical simulation. Now, uh, this is the point. If you face to face the basic idea that we were uh, trying to push in 1981 and the simulation that was done after 25 years, uh, you see that in fact, uh, there is no much difference. If you give uh, the same uh, information to the same guys, and, and he asks you why, then in this case, the answer is because of the noise. It is not always true. The noise is uh, taking the system. After all, there is no noise here. While there is a numerical, uh, there is an effect of the noise here. But uh, one thing is to uh, obtain uh, uh, the, the, the concept of noise is a little bit larger with respect to the one that we um, take as a heritage from the deterministic approach to, um, to classical mechanics. So uh, essentially the, the discussion about the noise was, uh, uh, was non-trivial and again I tell you that it's still non-trivial because there are many people saying that noise must not be uh, responsible for this uh, kind of behavior, even in, if you show the numerical simulations like the one that I was showing you before. Now let's go back to our climate problem. Okay, so we have two states. We have uh, our fundamental equation. Now, of course, uh, alpha is the albedo which uh, allow us to have two states. Then we can dimensionalize, dimensionalize these equations. And in particular, we can introduce a, a simple uh, variable phi, which goes between minus one and one. So everything goes in this way. I mean, so you have a, a deterministic equation, which the two states which refer to the climate and, and the present climate and the glacial climate. We have the noise that I told you is the noise that should be obtained from our present uh, uh, understanding and the measurements of climate fluctuations. And we have uh, the effect of climate forcing, of course, uh, because of Milankovitch forcing, of course, because the Milankovitch forcing, it's a relatively small, we take into account only in its uh, very simplified version. Then, uh, the problem was to compute the effect of the noise. At the time we were working, there were little knowledge about this problem. The only thing we knew was that in fact, the average, not the probability distribution, but the average time to go from one state to the other was exponentially linked to the amount of the noise. So we computed from the observation this number, tau s, which is a characteristic time of relaxation nearby our present climate. We compute this number from the assumption of having two climate states. We compute the noise effect from present measurement of the variance, so independently on B. And then we put these three numbers together and we get the number which was not so far from what we were looking at. I mean, there was an internal time assuming, the point is that assuming to have two states, there is an internal time associated to the existence of fluctuations, with this internal time scale is ordered 50,000 years. So we are in business. Now we put uh, the effects of the external forcing. Then we do again the, simulate the, the computation as we did for before. Now, instead of B, you have an extra term, but now the extra term will appear with oscillating in time with the plus or minus sign. And therefore, with respect to 
the one without this extra term, you see that the Milankovic forcing is now entering into the system uh, in an exponentially large way. I mean, it is not the effect of the Milankovic forcing is amplified or they amplified exponentially because of the noise. So uh, what happened, to make the story short, is very simple. This is the Milankovic forcing, which gives you almost nothing, okay, if you put inside one of the climate states. This is what happened without the Milankovic forcing. Then you put the two things together and you see very well defined periodic jump between one state to another. Now, of course, uh, if the noise is too small, then you can miss one of these jump, okay? And then eventually you can recover the signal. So at any rate, uh, the uh, jump will occur whenever you are in phase with the forcing. So that was, uh, this is in fact, uh, one of uh, the original paper published in TELUS. And you see that was done with the real number and so on. And you see that uh, what happened is that when you are here in the present climate state, then there is almost no probability to make a transition in this region. When you are here, 50,000 uh, here below before, then the probability to make a transition becomes very, very high. And therefore, I mean, here you take, in order to make a transition, you, the average time it's uh, order one million year. Here to make a transition, the average time is order one or 2,000 year. So you make a transition. So this was explaining the periodic oscillation. And this is the original graph that was done by hand, because at that time, everything was done by hand of the, of the paper. Now, some mistakes, Mark. At the time that we were making this, uh, this uh, effort, uh, uh, there was almost no knowledge on the probability distribution of the random time, actually uh, in stochastic differential equation. Okay, so uh, uh, that was uh, one minor limitation that was eventually uh, solved by us after a few years, because in 1983, we demonstrated that the probability distribution can be easily obtained from uh, um, the backward Kolmogorov equation. Then uh, there was almost no simulation numerically done uh, on the statistical property of random time transition. The reason why we did numerical simulation is, was because uh, we were uh, aware that uh, there was no knowledge about uh, the uh, probability distribution of the transition time. And therefore, we need to have a counterproof uh, from numerical simulation of this, uh, uh, of our original idea. And uh, this was uh, the reason of uh, uh, to do the numerical simulations. And uh, believe me, at the time, there was a lot of discussion how to perform a correct numerical simulations, okay? I remember that uh, there were mathematicians that were saying, I mean, this uh, mechanism uh, it cannot be true in not only physically, but also mathematically, because it cannot happen that you have a complete synchronization with an external uh, small periodic force. Uh, but eventually, uh, beside the numerical simulation, it was uh, Lipschaber, Poob, and I think someone else, I don't remember, that uh, showed that, uh, in fact, the stochastic resonance within a simplified electronic system with two states was uh, exactly correct. And also remember that at the time it was starting the major claim on uh, uh, the theory of chaos, and just after a few months of uh, the, um, after our first paper, we discovered that there was no possible, I mean, that the stochastic system reason was, uh, was uh, applying also for chaotic system. And uh, therefore there was also the possibility to observe uh, such periodicity with respect to the ex small external forcing, even if you don't have the noise, uh, which is of something that uh, is non-trivial. Why it is called a drastic resonance? Uh, I mean, the problem is very simple. After I mean, I think that three weeks after our first numerical simulation, we didn't write anything yet. 
but we were very it was very clear that the stochastic resonance was working and it was not called stochastic resonance so i went to a meeting in erice in sicily and uh, i was uh, showing these results and discussing with john imber okay it was march 80 and so john uh, that was a big boss uh, uh, of uh, climate he told me that uh, what why there is such a mechanism and he, he used the word resonance I was aware that there was no resonance, but in order to make it clear that the, the, the uh, that the something like resonance uh, can apply also in our case, I say, well, it's not exactly a resonance. I, I may call it stochastic resonance, and this is the reason why the noise, the name came out from in the literature, and so we call it the stochastic resonance because of John Imbry, essentially. Okay. Uh, did we get an answer to the problem? I don't know. Maybe yes. It really depends on what you call an answer. If you want to reproduce exactly the behavior of uh, the climate over the last one million year, probably the answer is no. But if you want to understand whether a small amount of external forcing can give you uh, an important effect, uh, the answer is yes. Another problem that we uh, discussed a lot of times uh, was about uh, the fact that uh, in our model, you have a sharp transition in uh, observed in climate record. And the people were questioning about the existence or non-existence of such sharp transition. Then after a while, Halley was uh, showing that in fact, the sharp transition occurred, okay? And in fact, uh, that was the triggering of other words. Uh, for instance, uh, one important point was raised by Ganopolsky and Ramshort, where they showed that um, the resident time distribution observed here in the Halley record uh, was very well reproduced by a simple model, but or more, sim more complex model, by assuming that in fact, uh, there is a kind of stochastic resonance acting also in, on a time scale which are below the 100,000 years. What is the legacy of our approach? Well, I mean, the, the most relevant legacy is definitely uh, the one that uh, there is a, a kind of cooperation between uh, um, internal mechanism and, and external forcing especially if we allow to uh, the system to have multiple climate states. So if nonlinear mechanics become to be the, the driving effect on the, on the climate change. Um, do we have any um, anything to say about the present debate on climate change, especially now uh, after the President Trump? Well, I mean, uh, I think the answer comes from this transparency. All the talk I'm speaking about is about this uh, blue stuff here, which represents the change of uh, radiation due to solar uh, change in eccentricity uh, of 0 0.25 watt per meter square. And this, uh, according to our naive, uh, uh, approach was giving us uh, about 0.2 degrees if you look at short time but if you look at long time you have a dramatic change this is what is our forcing in terms of watt per meter square okay and if you replicate this naive approach what happens is that you get the famous two degrees that everybody is speaking about so you may question whatever you want but this is our numbers and so to give you a clear picture that in fact uh, there is something to worry about and with this last transparency i thank you very much for your attention thank you uh, thank you roberto uh, for the very interesting presentation and i would uh, open the floor to questions there are already a couple of questions that I will read. I will ask the attendants to write their questions in the question and A section, in the Q and A section, sorry, 
and uh, so that I can read them to the speaker. So I will start with the first one by uh, Krishna Kumar. And he writes, the term stochastic resonance has become more general with usage for cases with relaxations of periodicity of forcing, et cetera. Would you agree with such varied usage of the term? Well, I mean, uh, at the time we were, I mean, if you go back to the paper in 1981, we were very, we make it very clearly that the mechanisms of stochastic resonance can be generalized and applied to many systems, okay? And so uh, uh, definitely, yes, I mean, the mechanism is still the same, okay? Uh, it can be due to additive noise, multiplicative noise, uh, uh, additive and multiplicative noise all together, but essentially it is always related, but it's also without noise, I mean, with chaotic system, it's always related to the probability distribution of time to go from one uh, region of the phase space to another with respect to the external forcing. So, I mean, it, it is not surprising that it can be generalized and that can be also discussed in many other framework. Uh, I, for instance, personally, I did one work recently in which uh, uh, the effect of stochastic resonance was explaining the, uh, pres the presence of uh, plastic events in amorphous solid when subjected to an oscillation, external oscillation. So, I mean, this is a very, very well uh, general. I do not, I, I totally agree. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I will read this question as well by uh, Krishna Kumar, as I think it's related to that. Um, can the mechanism of stochastic resonance be related to different phenomena coming out of interactions between additive and multiplicative, multiplicative parametric noises? And yes. Okay, so uh, this, I mean, um, okay, let's take, for instance, uh, the case of uh, Navier Stokes equation, okay, where I show that uh, everything goes as if there is an, an additive noise. In fact, this is not true. If you look in, uh, carefully to the equation, you discover that the noise cannot be simply added, but is uh, both multiplicative and added. But this is um, uh, somehow, uh, again, it, it is uh, not so surprising. I mean, the, the point is to understand, as I said before, uh, what is uh, uh, the probability distribution for the transition time. If it is Poisson, if it is uh, exponential, it, if it is a power law, no matter. I mean, there are very many, very different uh, um, uh, to, uh, possibility. And these possibilities are linked to different physical phenomena. So the question is uh, whether you understand these different phenomena. So the question, if you go back to the climate, is uh, the two, sti two states, not the mechanism of stochastic resonance by itself, okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, there are some questions from the chat. Uh, one is by Francois Schmidt. Uh, climate temperature fluctuations are found to be scaling and even multifractal. Is your model able to re reproduce scaling statistics, perhaps by changing the noise term and introducing correlations? Well, everything can be done if you put enough degrees of freedom. This is a general theorem that nobody says, but it's true. I mean, you can do that, okay? You have to increase the number of degrees of freedom. You have to take into account other mechanisms. The model by itself is uh, confined to explain just one thing. Now, of course, uh, if you want to explain more than that, if you want to do, if you want to look at the more uh, scaling, then the model as it is formulated cannot be used, but it can be used to understand uh, uh, the long, the long range, the long time behavior of the system. So uh, the answer is uh, uh, yes, if you give me enough time to build up the right model, okay? but not with the present uh, approach, with approach that 
I review. Remember that this is an historical review, not something that is done now. Okay. Okay, and then there's there's one from Tron uh, Iverson. Many thanks for this interesting presentation. Is stochastic resonance also relevant for millennium scale climate variations associated with variations in the ocean's thermal line circulation? Well, I think so, at least according to the paper that I saw, I was mentioning before, no? Uh, if I go back, assuming that I can do, okay? This was uh, the transparencies, uh, which I guess uh, um, it was as, uh, was behind the, the question. Uh, the question, the, the problem that I can see here is uh, uh, that in fact, uh, uh, it is not clear to me the periodic what what the external period, how the external periodicity is triggered, which is the mechanism. However, it is also true that in the case of climate um, dynamics, uh, if you want to take into account uh, the um, time scale introduced by um, sea ice and the ice over uh, the ice the glacier uh, then uh, you have uh, the possibility to open up the system to internal oscillations which may well trigger on different time scales something similar to a stochastic resonance as uh, andre and stefan were showing in this uh, very nice paper i don't know if it is an answer but i think uh, it is a partial answer yeah i guess so <laughs> as much as one can answer <laughs> in this very short yeah Tron says thanks so I guess it, it is answering the question um, so then there was one by um, Stephen Griffiths in your example of stochastic resonance driven by Navier Stokes turbulence how was the turbulence maintained so that it did not decay often the energy source is from a stochastic forcing but if that is the case then it makes the Navier-Stock model, model stochastic, whereas yeah. you refer to it as a deterministic model. Can you please correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, the, in this case, uh, but then we did it in more sophisticated case, okay? So I present mm -hmm. a very simple case uh, where the large scale, I mean, you are, suppose that you write the, mod, the equations uh, uh, properly in the Fourier mode uh, and everything. Okay, so we were assuming that there was a Fourier mode that has exactly the forcing that you see here. Either is a plus one or it's minus one. So it was either going in one, the system was as a, a very uh, large scale flow, either rotating in one sense or rotating in the other sense. Okay. So the force, the forcing was, uh, uh, was uh, from the point of view of uh, the time was stationary. So you increase, uh, you don't put any random, random behavior in the forcing. And this is the reason why I like it because uh, the internal noise is only coming from the internal uh, dynamics. Mm -hmm. So it is equivalent to a noise, but it's uh, not a noise, it's internal dynamics. Now you can do the same in Rayleigh Benard convection where the, intern the forcing is the temperature difference and in that case, uh, we did a paper where we show that, in fact, uh, you have a, a clockwise in counterclockwise um, uh, oscillation and uh, transition induced uh, uh, by the turbulence and not by the forcing. Uh, the same is true for the magnetodynamo, because uh, in that case, uh, we assume that everything, go, uh, the, the effect of the forcing is uh, essentially to to temperature in the system and not to something else. So I'm always referring to the case where the, the forcing is steady in the sense that it's maintaining a steady circulation. So if you go to very, very low, large, sorry, to extremely low Reynolds number, what happens is you are fixed in a single state without any possibility to move out of that. Once you open up uh, the turbulence, then you have the probability distribution, and then you can ask yourself whether the probability distribution is or not ergodic. 
according to our naive uh, intuition, it should be ergodic. And since it is ergodic, it must show transition. Now, the interesting point is that these transitions are qualitatively and somehow quantitative splitting equivalent to the one that you observe with the noise. So now you can, uh, this is a, 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 a complete, I guess, um, answer to your question, which is well put, of course. Okay, thanks. And it's uh, 3.30 and there's, there are still five questions. And I don't know uh, if Roberto is fine with uh, um, answering them, uh, but I would stop the uh, recording now. And uh, but, I, mean, okay. I can answer after okay. the recording. Okay. okay. I will stop the recording and then answer, we will answer the remaining questions. Um,